I am Valentin Fuster from New York, and I'm very pleased to chair a session after this uh, meeting, the American College of Cardiology Scientific Sessions of 2022, for one hour in trying to actually discuss with uh, my esteemed colleagues about a few trials. Uh, we choose eight of them, uh, very interesting trials, and I hope we have a, an excellent discussion. Let me, first of all, to introduce uh, the, um, the group, uh, the panelists that is going to be working with us, all very well recognized, uh, is Dr. Bikem Bothert, who is the incoming uh, Jack uh, uh, Hartfelia Editor-in-Chief, and is the Mary Ann Gordon uh, Kane Chair and Professor of Medicine and Director of the Winter Center for Heart Failure Research, actually at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Thank you for being here, uh, Beacon. Uh, Joanna, who we worked together for a number of years, and now she's at the Stanford, she's a sign, eh? um, And uh, she's the Irina and George Schaeffer Distinguished, Distinguished Chair in Cardiac Surgery and Chair of the Cardiac uh, Surgical Group at Sida Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Nice to see you again, Joanna. And then we have, uh, of course, uh, Viviana Tacchetti, who has been chairing the public, has been chairing the Publications Committee, and we all of us reporting to her, and it was a fantastic uh, experience for all of us. She's the Director of Cardiac Stress Laboratory at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And here we have uh, Dr. Paul Douglas, Chief of the Cardiology Division and Director of the Cardiovascular Services at the Atlanta Medical Center Interventional at uh, Worcester Cardiovascular Medicine in Atlanta. I'm so happy to be with you and to discuss all these trials. I, first of all, just for the audience, I'm going to mention the uh, eight trials that we're going to be discussing. And actually, these trials were presented in this order. Uh, the valor uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the, with the use of Mavacampton, uh, sodium restriction, the sodium HF uh, trial, uh, dietary sodium restriction heart failure, the POIS-3, uh, here we have an anti-fibrinolysis uh, agent, tranexamine, which uh, apparently prevents bleeding in non-cardiac surgery, a very interesting trial. And then we have the um, uh, Translate TIMI-70, uh, the use of bupenosin in patients uh, with a high elevation of non-HDL cholesterol, a new agent, very promising agent in the lipid uh, area. And then we have the Pacman AMI uh, study with alorcumumab uh, with the uh, imaging plaques in the coronary arteries of patients following myocardial infarction. And the use of uh, alirocumab is this making plaques to regress. Very interesting trial too, a study. And then we have the Explorer LTE, uh, which is about, uh, is a cohort of the MAV LTE study, also in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the use of Mavacampton. Then we have two surgical studies, uh, class PR study, uh, about the transcatheter tricuspid valve repair with the Pascal procedure. And then the USP bottle and uh, Surtevi trials with the looking at the biological valves, uh, surgical or trans, uh, uh, not surgical, to see how is the follow up at five years in terms of uh, deterioration. Is uh, TAVR in these cases better than surgical? aortic valve replacement for uh, biological degeneration of the valve. Well, this is a little bit of a sense of what we are going to be talking about. Again, we are discussing this in order as the papers were presented. And I'm going to start with a very interesting paper, the first one. Uh, this is the valor HSA, um, valor hypertrophic cardiomyopathy trial. Uh, the actual title of the study is Myosin Inhibition to the first surgical myectomy of alcohol septal ablation in obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And now this uh, is, was presented by Dr. Milin Desai from the Cleveland Clinic. Well, we all know that um, about half of the cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, maybe more, 
Uh, the cardiomyopathy is actually obstructive. And many of the symptoms, not all, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, relate to such degree of obstruction. What can we do? Well, today we have some medical therapies, but they are not directly related to, directed to the molecular basis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We use beta blockers and many other drugs, but are not specific. Then we have septal reduction therapies, uh, SRTs, uh, surgical septal myectomy or alcohol ablation. But these procedures actually uh, cannot be on the hands of everybody. And not, uh, there are not many centers specialized in using that. So there is a question, can we have a better medical or pharmacological agent that can be used uh, across the world, actually, in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This would be fantastic. Well, let's talk a moment about Mavacamptin. You know, we have been uh, talking about this over the last three years. Uh, Mavacamptin is a targeted in inhibitor of the cardiac myosin uh, acting bridge, decreasing the number of uh, such cross bridges and so reducing the contractility characteristic, the hypercontractility characteristic of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is the drug we are talking about. Well, the primary objective of this study was to determine if addition of mavacamptin to maximally tolerated medical therapy would allow severely symptomatic patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to improve sufficiently that no longer may need SRTs. These patients were actually scheduled to have, uh, because of the symptomatology, to have a septal ablation or surgical or by alcohol. But they decided to enter into the trial and see after 16 weeks if the things were such that they would prefer to continue on the drug than just being under septal ablation, surgical or non-surgical. These are the details of the study. 19 uh, institutions of the United States, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers. 12, 112 patients were randomized in Mavacampton at different dosages over the 16-week period versus placebo, 56 patients. And these patients, they started having the appropriate testing, you know, echocardiography uh, for the 11 ventricular ejection fraction, the outflow gradient at rest, and also with Valsalva. And they had repeated echoes over a period of 16 weeks. Well, interestingly, patients who entered into the study, maybe I already mentioned severe symptoms, a dynamic left ventricular gradient, peak gradient in this case of more than 50 millimeters of mercury, or with Valsalva, actually uh, more than 60, and referred within the past 12 months for SRT and they were a schedule, considering a schedule for the procedure. All this being said, this is the primary, the primary endpoint is what happens at 16 weeks? Do I go for SRT or I don't? This is the primary endpoint. Secondary endpoints, three important ones, change in post-exercise outflow tract gradient, then the number of patients who improve New York Heart Association classification, more than one class, or a change in the Kansas City uh, um, survey of quality of life, and then changes in NP, uh, BNP, and change in troponin-1. It's a very well done study, actually, with a lot of detail and very well presented. Here we have the average age of the patients in both groups, about 60 years, female, 48%. Uh, family history, 30%. Uh, myectomy was recommended in 85% of the patients with septal ablation, alcohol septal ablation in 14. This is obviously before the study. And the average peak gradient, 51 millimeters of mercury. Post-exercise uh, gradient, 82 millimeters of mercury. This is at baseline. Well, here we have the results. Interestingly, primary endpoint, how many patients uh, actually decided that SRT was not the way to go? 17% of Mavacamptin and, um, and, and the placebo, 60, let me repeat, 
60 or 76 percent of the placebo went into SRT, only 17 percent of the mavacantin went to SRT. So very significant results in terms of the of this primary outcome. Functional class improved one functional class in uh, in the mavacantin group, 63 percent in the placebo group, 21 uh, percent. Gradient, very interesting. Actually, the resting, uh, the resting peak gradient dropped in the mevacanthin group from uh, 46 millimeters of mercury to 14. And uh, post valsalva, 75 at baseline to 28 after uh, the, uh, the use of mevacanthin. No much change in ejection fraction. The Kansas City questionnaire, they did better. They increased 10 points, the mevacanthin group, not the placebo group. And NP, ProVNP, significant drop in the Mavacantin, 700 to uh, micrograms liter to 258. Troponin from 16 to actually uh, 10. So finally, adverse events, not much. Actually, sustained, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in the placebo group, 9, uh, 9%, sorry, nausea, 7%. In the mavacantin, 1% in the placebo, and a rash, 7% in the mavacantin group, zero in the placebo. So, in conclusion, mavacantin in this randomized study of 16 weeks, rather short, it really worked. Significant reduction in the eligibility for invasive SRT, uh, benefits in terms of reduction in the post exercise. A gradient in the post valsalva gradient, improvement in functional class in the Kansas City surveillance, and also in the NP pro VMP and in the troponin. And actually, safety is reasonably good. Well, I don't know if we are talking about a miracle here, Viviani. What do you think? That's a very nice summary, Dr. Fuster. Um, you know, I think uh, Taking a step back, uh, it, it sounds remarkable uh, in terms of at least the specific endpoints that they used, right? Which include, um, namely, um, a uh, a functional endpoint with looking at LVOT gradients, um, and also uh, the patient um, uh, symptom of of quality of life. I think. Uh, it's remarkable when you consider that this patient population has suffers from a very high burden of um, morbidity and mortality in ways that I think have been historically difficult because it represents potentially quite a heterogeneous group of patients. And so specifically for the HOCOM patients with obstructive disease, this is potentially a really, uh, a really compelling uh, non um, surgical or non-interventional approach that requires, I think, a lot more study. Um, and when you take a step back, um, it's fascinating in terms of mechanism. Thank you. Joanna, what do you think as a surgeon? What's happening here? I think this is potentially a tremendous ad. I mean, if you think that maybe four centers in the U.S. currently do a third, a third of all surgical septal reduction therapy, and there's this huge spread of expertise and a lack of access to it. This is potentially really important for this underserved patient group. And, and that spread in surgical expertise is mirrored in intervention. I think there are six centers that do about a quarter of alcohol septal ablations in the US. So again, this huge spread. And surgery, while it is super low risk in expert centers, it's about a 1% mortality, that's not negligible. And what I would be fascinated to see is the opportunity to do biopsies and genomics and proteomics in the patients that fail this potentially game-changing therapy based on surgical biopsies and compare those um, to those who haven't had this therapy. I'm fascinated to see the longer-term results of what is a what 16-week follow-up experiment. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's a short study, no, Paul? No? It, it is, but it, it really is an advance, I think, in the potential for treating a very difficult disease to manage. Uh, and so despite the fact that it was a very short trial, I'm uh, encouraged that maybe we will have something to offer these patients that we, that we haven't had before for a very difficult group of people to treat. Uh, I am a little concerned about uh, what Dr. Chickaway mentioned in that it, 
you know, ha- getting access to this kind of therapy, though, may be difficult for a large uh, percentage of the population who may suffer with this disease. So we need to keep that in mind as we uh, move the science forward. It's an important point. Uh, Deacon, what do you think? I'm very intrigued about the titration. Uh, because in this study, the patients uh, underwent echocardiography every four weeks to titrate the medication up and down. So I'd love to hear a little bit more, um, maybe uh, in the subsequent uh, publications to come, what percentage require the, the, those uh, reductions and uh, whether the, in the implementation phase, that component of titration according to the gradient and the decline in EF is gonna be critical. Yes, the number of patients that they had that showed a decline in less than 50% were rather small, 3.6%, but not negligible. Uh, So in the aftermath of the Explorer and the Explorer LTE, I think the the U-shaped curve of where there's a safety uh, is gonna be an issue for us, uh, is gonna be an important concept on the implementation. So echoing frequently just to show when the LV is declining is a critical concept. And these big centers were able to do it well. I also would love to see a little bit more about the QTC, uh, which I know they didn't report, uh, but had been reported in other studies. That's another variable for titration. So in the titration, you look at the EF, you look at the QTC, and in some studies, they looked also the plasma levels. Well, we have another study to discuss today, uh, as you know, with Meva Campton, a little bit longer study, and I, we have a question about side effects, but we'll talk about later. Well, I think this is a, certainly a very uh, attractive study, the first one, and let's go to the second. Sure, patients with uh, heart failure have retention of sodium. In fact, we are going to talk about the Sodium HF study. Uh, the actual title is Study of Dietary Intervention Under 100 Millimolar in, in heart failure. Dr. Justin Zekovic uh, from the Alberta Heart Institute in Canada is the uh, presenter of this uh, very interesting study. Well, before I started to read it, I said, well, it should work. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, we all know what happened with heart failure, retention, retention of fluid and the use of diuretics. And the question is, why we don't try to do something different and is to restrict sodium. Well, there are nine studies in the literature thus far in which uh, actually without consistent results. Actually, there's one editorial from time to time about sodium. (laughs) And I already know the people who are against and those who are in favor, but anyway, are very well recognized. So this is certainly a a type of uh, approach in patients with heart failure that can be questionable. Well, this is the study. Patients with heart failure at 12 months, actually, if I recall, were reduce ejection fraction and also preserve ejection fraction. They were both. But the primary endpoint is the composite of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular hospitalization, and cardiovascular emergency room visits. And secondary endpoints are quality of life, KCCQ, the six-minute walk, and the New York Heart Association classification. Well, you're probably asking how many patients. Here we are. It's 841 patients. Class uh, NY, uh, New York Heart Association, two or three. Optimally tolerated medical therapy. And they were uh, randomized into less than 1,500 milligrams daily of sodium versus usual care. Now, the follow-up actually was 12 months. And I already mentioned the primary endpoint, our heart endpoints. And the secondary endpoints are actually have to do with quality, as we discussed. Uh, these patients uh, had to confirm the diagnosis of heart failure, of course. And I think I already mentioned most of this story. The exclusion, however, patients on hemodialysis, uh, the pen or any stage chronic uh, um, renal failure, or hospitalization uh, within the previous month. So these patients were reasonably stable. <laughs> I don't know how they follow these diets. Uh, I don't know, Rick, but they, they look at individualized food, what they should eat, not eat. And at the, at the very end, they surveil uh, three days of food records and make the decision how things work. I don't know how accurate this is. Uh, I, I like to learn from you people. Who was there? Well, uh, age six, 66 as an average in both groups, 
female sex, 32%, and then diagnosed with heart failure for more than a year, 68%, hospitalized in the last 12 months, 32%, ejection fraction average, 36%. All right. Now, here comes an issue, and well, one third or half a coronary disease, 39%, atrial fibrillation and so forth. But I have a question that maybe when I finish, I'd like somebody to answer. I don't know they use diuretics here. You know, they use certainly MRAs, but not the state for diuretic, which is a question I have for all these experts that are going to talk in a moment. Well, let's go into the primary outcomes. Nothing, no difference, one year. About what, ha what changed there, the patients felt a little bit better in terms of the functional class, whether they look at the New York Heart Association, the KCCQ, or the walking distance. It's slightly better. So quality of life is slightly improved. Let me go into the conclusions. Since this is a very straightforward study. In ambulatory patients with heart failure, a dietary intervention to reduce sodium intake did not reduce clinical events. There was a um, modest benefit on quality of life as measured by the three mechanisms I mentioned. And uh, that's very all. I, very all uh, is all what I can say. Bikram, I'd like to hear what is your opinion about the studies. It, it goes into your hypothesis of work or just you don't believe what you are doing and you have to get into this? It's a very hard intervention to do dietary uh, randomized studies. And this is an unblinded study. As you alluded to, Dr. Fuster, uh, food surveys with re, uh, you know, recollection of what you have eaten, and this was a three-day uh, diary, are with a lot of limitations. And this is a one year long study where they are getting this dietary survey. And if you look at the difference in the intervention arm, it was only 415 milligrams, which is one tenth or less than one tenth of a teaspoon of a difference. So the magnitude, even by recall bias was so little, even when the people are intending to appear compliant, um, whether this is a, whether the survey you know, food survey is a reliable tool. It's been validated to correlate to urinary sodium in hypertension healthy and non-diuretic using heart failure patients. But the magic is the following. The, uh, the survey usually uh, predicts 22% reduction than what the urinary sodium implies. So even if when people are just giving a you know, response, there is a probably a um, exaggeration of 22% of reduction in their salt intake by what they think they are taking. So if we were to take that into consideration, the, the, the difference in the diet at the end of the year is not that much. And what did they do? They told them not to eat fast food, processed food. And I'm sure that resulted in some improvement, but of course this unblinding and uh, you know, probably the recall bias and also these effects on quality of life and NYHA class could be related to the individual's recall. But would sodium reduction work if it could be implemented by true dietary replacements? Likely, but I'm not so sure whether this, this intervention resulted in a meaningful salt reduction. Well, uh, Paul, uh, let me ask you following Beacon, I don't wish you to be on heart failure, okay? Let's let's be sure that you understand. But let me tell you something. Would you be going to this torture? Uh, I think you would have to lock me up, Dr. Fuster, to uh, get me to <laughs> be this uh, compliant. Uh, and I think that that is the case in, in most of these trials, you know, that if you really, if you're living in a free society, it is extremely difficult for you to really be adherent to these types of measures. Uh, and despite the fact that I, I think that they did as good a job as they probably could have done, uh, the amount of sodium intake um, is really questionable and the difference that they've measured is really minimal. Uh, so to answer your question, no, you'd have to lock me up to get me to eat like this and, uh, and it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. Thank you. Viviani, I guess, you know, what I tell my patients is avoid salty foods, don't put salt in the table. That's it. <laughs> what, do, what do you tell them? 
I think it's such an important but challenging topic, right? Because even when you look at the specific trial, it happened in a very international uh, stage, but it included countries like Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And then it included um, several Latin American countries, including Mexico and Chile. And so you can imagine even the dietary um, uh, instructions have to vary so much. And what's available as occult sodium in some of the foods that may be most readily available to some of the patients that enrolled may vary tremendously, you know, and it's impossible to really um, account for that. And even um, in best case scenarios, counsel patients to avoid those. So very challenging. And then another, I think, challenging aspect, you know, in order to capture events, they had a very broadly defined composite primary endpoint, which included all cause mortality, cardiovascular hospitalization and cardiovascular emergency room visits. And so in the end, you're not really sure what you're capturing um, when you're looking at such a broad endpoint and you're looking at a very different potential patient population in terms of who, who is taking what instructions and who has access to the right foods. Thank you, Viviani. Now, the last word is a word by the surgeon. Important study, and it's not just the lack of a possible benefit, it's the opportunity cost here. Our patients are burdened with a whole number of instructions, advice that we really want them to take. And the opportunity cost of this is another burdensome piece of advice um, at the expense of proven strategies that can reduce mortality and, and improve survival and, and symptoms. So not negligible. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay, we'll, clo- we'll, we'll call the, the study difficult to be carried out and we'll do the best we can for our patients. Now let's go into the third one now. This is an interesting one. In, in fact, it was educational to me. I don't know how much you knew about it, but this is this uh, tanexamic acid in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Uh, it's the so-called POIS-3 study a study presented by Dr. Devero from the uh, Research Institute, the Population Health Research Institute in Hamilton, Canada. Well, all has to do with perioperative bleeding um, in patients with non-cardiac surgery. And how can you prevent it? Well, let's go into the incidence and, and the impact of this. Uh, the tranexamic acid, we'll call TXA, is actually an antifibrinolytic drug And obviously you say, well, this is great. You might prevent bleeding, but you might create thrombosis. So, and this is the key of this study, how effective it is in preventing bleeding and how safe it is in not inducing a thromboembolic disease. So here's the story. In patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery and who are at risk of bleeding and vascular events, does TXA reduce occurrence of life-threatening measure of critical organ bleeding? Is TXA non inferior for occurrence of major measured vascular complications within actually, this is a 30 day study. Well, and this is actually compared with placebo. These patients were randomized to receive um, the drug TXA one gram uh, IV bolus or placebo at the start and end of surgery. Follow up troponin on first three days after surgery. Uh, study personal follow-up of the patients, very connected for 30 days and so forth, just the usual. Now we have to get into um, the primary uh, efficacy outcome of 30 days after randomization. And actually, uh, I already mentioned bleeding, but he is more precise, composite of life-threatening measure and critical organ bleeding. We'll talk about this later. And the primary safety outcome all has, to with, all has to do with thromboembolic disease. Baseline characteristics, uh, 4,000 patients actually in each group, almost 5,000, mean age 70 years, male 56%, history of coronary disease 30%, peripheral disease 15%, and the, the surgery, the non-cardiac surgery was major surgery, major surgery in 80%. So we are not talking about trivial surgery. And now comes the primary efficacy outcomes. Here we have what happens at 30 days. Okay, 
the composite of the bleeding, primary endpoint, 9.1% TXA versus 11.7% in the placebo group. Remember, 5,000 patients in each group. Primary safety outcome, uh, equal. The, the, all the thromboembolic aspect, the composite of vascular events, 14% versus 13.9%. Now, secondary bleeding outcomes, here they go to the type of bleeding. And actually, the only one that was very significant was measure bleeding, not life-threatening bleeding, not critical organ bleeding, measure bleeding. 7.6% in the TXA versus 10.4% in the placebo. All right. Then we're going to tertiary bleeding outcomes. Let me focus on transfusion. 9.4% in the TXA, 12% in the placebo. Conclusions. Among patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery, TXA reduced risk of composite of life-threatening measure and critical organ bleeding. Although TXA had no significant effect on measure vascular complications, non-inferiority was not established. It was similar, didn't get there. And now come the implications. <laughs> uh, I have to go and get a beer because God, the implications is maybe I'm missing the whole thing here. These are the implications. The majority of patients having non-cardiac surgery do not receive TXA. You will tell me in a moment, Joanna, what this is about. Given that 300 million surgeries occur annually worldwide, POIS-3 identifies that use of TXA could avoid upwards of 8 million bleeding events resulting in transfusion on an annual basis, indicating potential for large public health and, and clinical benefit. Well, look, we have a paper in front of me that I missed completely until today. And maybe I'm going to ask you, Joanna, is, what do you know about tranexamic acid? So in the cardiac surgery world, there's probably about 20 years worth of trials and meta-analysis that show that tranexamic acid reduces blood loss, reduces transfusion requirement, and it isn't associated with an increase in thrombotic events like myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, or peripheral embolism or pulmonary embolism. So we use it, a recent survey I think showed 90, 88, 99, 90% of cases and institutions use it routinely. I'm kind of surprised that number isn't higher. It's a benign drug, it's really effective. And it's fascinating to me that non-cardiac surgery has been a little bit slow to this party. This is a really well-designed trial as far as I can yeah. see, it's adequately powered. They've been really thoughtful about their endpoints. Um, the safety endpoint to me is pretty compelling and certainly the efficacy endpoint. Um, if I was, uh, counseling a family member about to have major surgery or orthopedic surgery, I, I absolutely recommend they got tranexamic acid, great drug. I'm curious what the barriers are to using it, be it cost or availability. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Bidiani, how much do you know about this drug? You know, so I have to say as a, as a cardiologist, very little, and I was fascinated by Dr. Chikwe's um, response because yeah. when I look at the data from these trial um, results, there seemed to be a subgroup uh, signal towards uh, favoring the drug in terms of beneficial impact of um, lowering bleeding complications, particularly for orthopedic uh, surgeries, but was seen and, um, and also general surgeries, although it was seen for all surgeries uh, together. So it made me think about whether perhaps there was a patient substrate uh, of younger patients, or maybe there's more bleeding associated with those kinds of surgeries where you might even see more of a benefit. And so hearing uh, Dr. Chikwe's um, overall evaluation, it, it makes me realize that maybe, you know, it, it, it seems that there would be tremendous potential in um, non-cardiac surgeries. If the safety signal has been very favorable for cardiac patients, um, it would seem that the thrombotic risk is actually relatively low, particularly given that, you know, we're looking at patients who may be a lot healthier and don't have, um, uh, as much uh, cardiovascular um, uh, risk. And so fascinating to think about what those barriers are, why it hasn't been implemented more broadly. Um, it seems quite promising based on these results and prior studies. Thank you. Beacon? I find it fascinating, yes. Um, I'm also intrigued by uh, Joanne's uh, comments. My questions are in the practice, once this is used postoperatively, how to transition to anticoagulation strategies, let's say for hip surgery and others. 
Uh, do we need to now be ready for this overlap period where we're going to be looking into how to institute the anticoagulation immediately after the tranexamic acid use? Interesting. Uh, Joanna, do you have any comment about this? So generally we dose it at the start of surgery or just on induction and at the end. It's not something that we run into the post-operative period. Um, and it shouldn't necessarily change your normal approach to uh, venous thromboembolic prophylaxis. So all of our patients will leave the OR and get started on subcute heparin and aspirin post-op day one. And I envisage it's the same for orthopedics. Thank you, Paul. How many times do you use it uh, weekly? Uh, I am not as familiar uh, as Dr. Tickway with this drug. We know that they use it in the OR, though, prior to a lot of the uh, uh, surgery. So I'm always a little frightened, though, about things that we're going to apply to everybody. And so I think that it's important that we look for those important signals that may uh, raise some uh, safety issues and look at those subgroup analyses and be sure that this is something that is applicable to everybody who's having non-cardiac surgery. And you make a great point because we've been burnt as a community before with antifibrinolytics that did have mm -hmm. an increased incidence of adverse events and possibly a signal towards increased mortality. But the data supporting tranexamic acid as a safe way to reduce bleeding is pretty robust. And this is great to add to the non-cardiac surgery um, cohort. What it seems is the study is very well done though. I mean, it, it seems to be methodologically, isn't it? Okay, well, thank you. It's uh, something to carry home here uh, of importance. We have so uh, much thank you to learn from our surgical colleagues. I think that's a really great example. Of yeah, that. tomorrow we'll start asking. I will do a survey of all the surgical colleagues here. I will start with your friend, Dr. Adams, uh, Joanna. Thank you.